We are right now in the middle of a series called Reset. By the way, thank you guys for being here. If you're watching online, thanks for, for tuning in this morning for Church Online. Um, and here's what we're doing in Reset. So our goal in this series is to reset how you do faith. Many of us, what we do is when it comes to like our relationship with God, we think it's a thing where, okay, I go to a place on Sunday morning, and that's what it means to be a Jesus follower. But last week, we said, listen, no, what this is all about is you, it's not about, listen, going to church, although, listen, we're glad that you're in church. Like, I have to say that because you're here. Like, it'd be awkward if I was like, we don't care if you're here. No, we care, okay? But it's not about that. It's about you falling in love with Jesus. That's what we want for you as a church and church family. We want you to know and grow in the Lord. And so I thought to sort of set this up, like this week, you know, we talked about knowing God. Let me set up this week's talk this way. So um, a little while back, I won't say how long, um, I, was, I was teaching one of my sons, I won't say which one, how to ride a bike. And uh, we had this moment where, we, he, where he was going around the street and, and, and like he had just gotten like the, like the not fall over part, you know, and he was so thrilled with that. But he wasn't so great at stopping. And so he amped up his speed, he's going down the block, and then in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, he flew into a mailbox and crashed, just poof, and then down to the ground. And then he wasn't hurt, he was fine. He actually, like, he was so shocked by it, he was actually just lying on the ground, like, eyes wide, not even crying, he's like, whoa. Like, oh, right? It was the craziest thing. He hit this mailbox, but, but you know what? The mailbox stayed standing. Like he hit this thing, but yet because the mailbox was so, like it had this, this, you know, it was into the ground and there was cement involved, it stood there because it was so well rooted. And I'm bringing this up because I want you to know that your faith is like that when you root it in the right things. Like when it comes to your relationship with God, there are going to be times where things, they absolutely just boom, hit you, right? and yet you will stay standing like that mailbox. And, and the reason that you will is because of the foundation that is laid in your heart, particularly as people of God, if you are rooted in the word. If you're rooted in the Bible, if you're rooted in not what this world says about you, not what this world says about life, but what God says about you and what God says about life. Because here's the truth. Um, none of us have, have done this before right? I mean, like, none of us have been human beings before. None of us have gone through the scope of an entire life. We're kind of guessing at this as we go. But what if there was someone who knew more about it than any of us who, I dare say, designed it? And what if he gave us a guide for how to do this thing called life? And we believe that's found in the scriptures. And so today I thought I'd actually show you something. I brought with me today my very first Bible this is it right here. I got this thing. I'm, I'm gonna, I don't know if you can see this here. I got this thing on September 23rd, 1990, 30 years ago. I have no idea where that time went. Wow. I got this Bible when I was a kid. I think after I had been confirmed in the church, that like the church like gave us Bibles, and I received it. I opened it a couple times, and it looked really boring. There were no pictures. I didn't necessarily understand what I was reading, and so I took it, and I sat it on my shelf, and there it collected dust for years. But then the most remarkable thing happened. Um, I got saved. Like the Lord intervened in my life. I wasn't looking for him. I didn't even know that I needed him. I thought I was good. And then Jesus showed up in an instant. The Holy Spirit fell on me. That's a talk for another day. All right. But he made, he brought me from spiritual death to life. And suddenly people were telling me, you need to read your Bible. So I'm like, all right. So I go home and I open up and I start reading it. And, it, and like what happens was these words that I had had before, they were suddenly they, like they were coming to life. Like, like they were speaking to me in a way that, it, that they had never had before because up until then I had been dead in my sin, but suddenly the Holy Spirit, because he brought me to life, he began to speak to me through the Bible. I began to learn about life. I began to learn what it means like to, to be a child of God, even who God is. I didn't know before. I, I guessed. I kind of put some things together, some right, some wrong, but I didn't know. But here, was, here's, here were the scriptures, and God was bringing to life to me all the things that I needed to know about going forward in life, and I shouldn't be surprised by it because it actually says in the Bible, I love this. This is Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet. And a light to my path. If you've had this for a while, you might remember the old Amy Grant song with that, right? Thy word. Thank you. I'll be in the worship band next week. So look. Um. <laughs> but it is. Because all of us, we're walking down this dark path of life. We have no idea what's coming. 
We have no idea what's ahead, but God's word, he shines to us, not the entire path, just immediately where we are, this step that I can take, this light to my feet so I know that I don't step off a cliff or I don't step into a lake or anything like that. Now, here's the thing, okay? What I don't want to do today is do one of these talks where I say, so pastor says, just read the Bible more. And you go, well, that doesn't help, all right? Because here's the thing. I know that the Bible, here's the thing, like the Bible is not like any other book you've ever read, right? It's not like Harry Potter where you just open it up at the beginning and it's just one coherent thing you read from beginning to end. Like there's a lot of stuff in the Bible. Like, I mean, like where do you even begin with this? And this is why I I encounter as I talk with people more about, okay, like begin to engage your relationship with God through reading the scriptures. A lot of people are like, I would love to, but I have no idea where to begin. It's really intimidating. Like it involves cultures that are thousands of years old. Like how do I study the Bible in a way that is life-giving? How do I study the Bible in a way where I'm not falling asleep while I'm reading it, and something actually speaks to my soul. I'm sure you've never been there. Well, you're in luck, because today we're going to talk about how to study the Bible, and I'm going to give you some basics of it. Now, to begin with that, what I'd like to do, because we might go, okay, you're telling me it's not like any other book that I've ever read. That's right, it's not, because it's not even just one book. This thing right here with the cover, okay, it's not one book. There's actually 66 books in here. It's a library under a cover. So what do you do? How do you you begin to engage this thing? And by the way, the stuff that's in it isn't chronological. What do you do with that? I said, you'll be reading, but okay, I I see people going forward, and now, wait, didn't that kingdom already end? Yes, it did. So how do, I, how do we make sense of this thing? How do we begin to in, like, encounter God through the scriptures when it just seems like it's so all over the place? Well, the very fa- first place we're going to do is we're just going to begin by asking the question, what is the Bible? Like, we have to understand what this thing even is and what's in the pages if we're going to properly dig into it. And so to do that today, we're going to show you a video to start. It's a fun little cartoon by our friends over at the Bible Project. Let's check it out. Hey, real quick, I want to, they just told me, uh, online family, I'm sorry if uh, the video there didn't work. Uh, we love you. Uh, we'll, do, we'll post the link for it online later this week, so just stick with us. So, but look, that, that's, that's the Bible. That's how we have the books that we have. That's, that's why we have the books that we have. And okay, we, we sort of saw this overview of a story of the people of Israel, right? And, and okay, like their, their, uh, their exile, and then also Jesus arriving on the scene, and everything that you read in the Bible, any place, it's going to fall somewhere into that story. Okay, either like they were in slavery and they were set free, or uh, like going forward, like they, they form a nation, the nation divides, you know, and then they're carried off into exile, and then Jesus arrives. Like that's, that's everything in the Scripture. Something is going to fit somewhere into that. And so we go, okay, well, so that's good to know. Now, but but like, how do I even get the ball rolling with my study of the scriptures and, and asking God to speak to me through them? Well, I've got four things today that I want to suggest that you do. And if you're taking notes, uh, you can write them down. They're just sort of a play-by-play. The very first thing that, that we want you to do as you begin to read the word is this, pick a Bible. Pick a Bible. And you go, well, what, what do you mean? Well, there are all kinds of different translations of the Bible, right? And I, so I don't mean, by the way, just like pick one forever. So listen, like, you know, if you pick the NIV, that's all you're ever going to read. I don't mean it like that. Like, but what I mean is, okay, listen, pick a translation. In English, there are typically one of three kinds of Bibles you're going to encounter. One is going to be what's called uh, a, a formal translation. And what that means is, like, there's a group of people, it's, it's never just one person. And just know that, by the way, when we talk about translations, it's not like a guy, like, went in the back room and went, okay, I think I've got it. Like, no, like, councils of people, all right? And what the formal translation does is, to the best of the, of the translator's abilities, they want to stay as close as they can to the literal wording of the Greek and Hebrew and sometimes Aramaic texts. Now, no translation is 100% like word to word. And the reason they're not is because languages don't work that way. So sometimes things that make sense in Greek, for instance, make no sense in English. Like if they were to just sort of translate, like, hey, like beginning a sentence with the, the object versus the subject, like it, just, it wouldn't make sense. And so there's always some kind of interpretation working with a formal translation. In the same way, there's no such thing as a perfect translation. Sometimes what happens is like, you find groups who are really dogmatic about a particular translation. And I'm just going to say it, King James. 
All right, like there's always like like there like there are people who they believe like the holiest translation of the Bible is the Old King James. Now, fun fact for you, it's not perfect. Okay, and I don't have time to go into all the ways that it's not. Okay, but there, there are some advantages to the King James. But listen, some people like there are religious groups that through misinformation have believed that any other translation is somehow corrupt. And so like, usually the groups who believe King James only, if you were to sort of dial it back to the history of that movement, what it comes down to is a belief that somehow throughout the last 2,000 years, they, they believe that the Catholic Church found original Greek and Hebrew manuscripts and stole them and hid them. And only the King James has the accurate translation. Now, can I prove that they're wrong? No. In the same way, I can't prove that people don't live on Mars. But the evidence would suggest that, there, that, that no, that's not the case. Like there's, there's no evidence for this belief. And so, and so listen, but there are these things called formal translation, like going as close as they can to literal wording. But then there are these other things called functional translations, all right? And what a functional translation does, and so like formal would be something like New American Standard Bible, NRSV, something like that. Functional, what functional does is it tries to get the idea of the wording, and so, for instance, like there, there may be like something that, that's like an allegory for people who, like in the ancient Hebrew world, that makes no sense to us in, in, now in, in the, the 21st century. So what they'll do is, okay, listen, here's the idea of the allegory. We'll just present it this way. So their, their purpose is understanding the idea rather than the specific wording. So you got formal, you got functional, some translation, and, and those would be like the New Living Translation, um, uh, the, the CV, Contemporary English Version. Those would be... Those would be uh, functional translations. Then you have some Bibles that what they do is they merge the two. So they try to go, listen, let's keep things as close as we can, but sometimes that's not going to work, and so it's formal and functional. And lastly, they're what are called paraphrases. And what a paraphrase is, it's not a translation. Somebody just took like a translation that already existed, and they decided, okay, I'm going to spice up the wording and make it easier to understand. And so, you know, like it's, it's not word to word, it's not idea to idea, it's just sort of, okay, I want you to get this. It's not translation at all. So I'll give you a few examples, all right? Here, here's, the, sort of understand the difference between these three. So formal, uh, functional, and paraphrase. So let's take a verse here. So for instance, Acts 26, 14. Here's the NASB, the New American Standard Bible's translation of this. And this, is, this would be a formal translation, okay? And so here's, here's uh, Paul. He, he's recounting his conversion to being a Christian. He says, and when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, clunky English, and also, what is a goad? We don't know. Like that, that's, not, that's not an illustration that we use, right? Now, let's take that same verse, and this would be a, a, a functional translation. The idea, let's, let's get the idea across. So this would be the New, America, or the New Living Translation, which is the Bibles that we give out here. Okay, so here's the same verse, Paul recounting, we all fell down. See this, like, you see the smoother language there? We all fell down, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic. Okay, it doesn't say Hebrew dialect, Aramaic, because that's what he was talking about. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is useless for you to fight against my will. See the difference there? Okay, like kicking against the goads, that's an illustration of fighting against someone's will. So the, the, the New Living Translation, they just go, here's what they're saying. And then we could go even a step further, and this would be a paraphrase. This would be Eugene Peterson's The Message, okay? And here's what he says about it. We fell flat on our faces. Then I heard a voice in Hebrew. Saul, Saul, why are you out to get me? And why do you insist on going against the grain? All right. Now, what's that? Well, that's a paraphrase. Is, is, is it drawing from the original text? Well, in the sense that it wants you to get a thought across, but there's a lot more liberty taken. So that's the difference between the three. So what we say is, listen, pick a Bible, Pick one that's going to speak to where you're at, that's going to speak to how you're wired. With, like, are you really interested in, in, in digging into, okay, like, what's this literal wording here? Or do you just want to get the idea of it? What's, what's, like, what's your goal in your, in your time with the Lord and your, and your engaging of the Scriptures? Pick a Bible accordingly. Now, here's the next thing that we want you to do, okay? Find out the genre of the book. Because, again, this is not like any other book you've ever read where it's just one genre, cover, cover. Let me say it like this. We have anybody here who likes Barnes and Noble or a bookstore? Come on, hands up. You're like, yeah, oh, God bless you. Praise the Lord for you. You're more sanctified. So look, um, that's a joke. So um, some of you are like, really? No. Um, I like going to Barnes and Noble. I do. 
I go in there, and I like, in Barnes & Noble, they've got these, like, giant signs over the different sections, right? One would be, like, travel. The other would be, like, children's books. The other would be, like, cookbooks or, or fiction. I, I love that. But here's, here's the thing, though. You know why those signs are there? Because not every book is the same genre. Like, imagine, imagine okay, I left the history section, right? And I read about, I read about how the Atlanta Falcons blew it in the fourth quarter in the Super Bowl. We're praying for your soul. Look. Okay. And then I go over to the fiction section, and I read about, you know, Frodo and the Lord of the Rings, okay? And I read the fiction book, and I go like, okay, I know that this didn't actually happen. Now, I wish the Falcons one didn't actually happen, but that's where I am in life, all right? And so, okay, how do I know which one is true? Because they, they, they might be written very similar, like they're, they're telling a story. Well, the way I know is the genre. In the same way, like, are there times where the Bible talks about stuff that's fiction? Yes. Now, let me be clear before you try and throw me out. There are these things called parables, where what Jesus does is he tells a fictitious story to illustrate a point. Now, is all of the Bible fiction? No. Is it true in what it reports? Absolutely. Like, when it talks about history, like, you should believe the history. In the same way, listen, like, there's, there's not just, like, sort of, you know, uh, like uh, fiction or, or, or what we would call narrative. There, there's all kinds of genres in the Bible. So you've got narrative, that would be sort of like reporting history, like historical events. You have what's called law, just list of do this, don't do that. Okay? You have other things like poetry, like the book of Psalms. Like, like, and, we, and we should know that it's poetry, that the language is flowery, right? So like, like the author of the Psalms, be like, listen, like the Lord has laid the earth on its foundations. Well, does the author of the Psalms expect the earth to be sitting on like stone in space? No. The author wants you to know, listen, God has established the earth. Just like you would build a house, he's built the foundation, okay? Like, but there's not just that. There's also like wisdom literature. There's prophetic literature. There's gospels which record the life of Jesus. There's, there's the epistles in the New Testament. Like most of the New Testament are what are called epistles. And what epistles are is basically they're letters. They're letters of specific historic context. Like they're written from a church leader to a church about here's what's happening in your church. Here's what you do about it. And then there's another thing called apocalyptic. You go, how am I going to remember all this? Google. Google. Well, listen, whatever book of the Bible you decide to read, Google the, uh, the, the type of book that it is. Google the, the genre of it. Okay, and th that leads to the next thing, and this kind of flows out of that. So the third thing you want to do when you're beginning to study the Bible for yourself, I love saying this, let the context be your guide. Remember years ago, it was a Jiminy Cricket used to say that, right? Like, let your conscience be your guide, Pinocchio, you know? Listen, let the context be your guide. Here's why this is so important. Let me say it to you this way. Um, so imagine I said to you, hey, catch the tea. All right? Depending on where you live and, and where you are in the like, world, that could mean one of a few things. For instance, okay, catch the tea. Maybe what I'm saying is if you live in Boston, go catch the subway train because they call that the tea. All right, that's, and that context shows that. Maybe you live on Sesame Street. And so when I say catch the tea, I mean, a literal tea is going to fall out of the sky and you need to catch it. Right? In the same way, okay, listen, like, maybe I'm saying catch the tea, like we're in the grocery store and I'm tossing you some Earl Grey. The way that you know, like, what I mean in that statement is what's called the context, what's happening around it. In the same way, sometimes what we do when we read the Bible is we isolate verses. We don't understand, like, the context going into them, and we misread them. I'll give you an example. Probably, I think, one of the most uh, misquoted verses in the Bible. And before I say this, let me just, I don't want to deflate personal uh, impact. And so it's possible that sometimes, like, you read a verse, it's not the context of it at all. But man, God just spoke to your heart through that, and you need to hear that at a specific time. That is fine and right and good. I'm saying for you understanding the scriptures, you need to let them know. You need to know the context of it. So I think this is one of the most misquoted verses in the Bible. It's Jeremiah 29, 11, where God says this. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And that sounds really good, right? The problem is this. Many a well-intentioned Christian has taken verses like this and they assume some things about their life that God has never promised. For instance, they go, listen, well, God says he's going to prosper me. I'm going to get some money. I'll be all right. 
and also not harm me. So I know, listen, if I believe in Jesus well enough, I'll never suffer. It's not true. In fact, if you want to know the context of this verse, here's the context word. Jeremiah the prophet, he's being spoken to by God, and he's not being spoken to for an individual, but a people. The you there is plural. And he's talking about not one person, but a nation of people. The nation of Israel, who are in exile, and God is basically telling us, listen, I'm going to restore this people as a people, a country, a group. And so here's the context, okay, and that's, that's not individual, how I feel good that like God will do everything for me. No. The context is God is going to restore his name in these people. So listen, here's like, so we read Jeremiah 29, 11. Here's what verse 10 says. Look, it says, okay, so here's context. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, so right now we know specific time in history, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. So to people who think like God has abandoned their nation and abandoned all of their ethnic people, he says, okay, listen, I'm going to bring you back for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Things have fallen apart, but I'm not done. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. And then he says like this, and then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. Because I'll have broken your hearts as a people. You turned away from me, but you're gonna come back and I'm gonna go right to you. You will seek me, he says. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. He says, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. See the specific context there? Captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have... Banished you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. You see how the context is very different from how most of us read that verse? And again, listen, like maybe you went through a rough time and the Lord just spoke to you and you were like, okay, like, and, and, he, and like, the Spirit was like, listen, I know the plans I have for you. And you're like, thank you, I needed to hear that. I'm not knocking that. But if we're going to be students of the word, if we want to get a bigger picture, if we want to like understand what God's saying to all of us as a people, and, and I would even argue like there are times personally we need this as well, we have to understand a thing called context. Let the context be your guide. So here's the last thing I'm going to tell you to do. Okay, ready? Number four, get help. Get help. I'm like, like well, I, What? Oh, no, I should just be on my own. No, no. We are a people who are blessed with resources. I mean, have you ever thought about that? Like, sometimes we think, okay, like, like, the stuff that we've got is somehow an affront to our relationship with God. And maybe if we let it take, a, like, a, a place that it shouldn't, it can be. But listen, God has blessed us with all kinds of resources as a people. I, I, I just all the time, I had this thing called the Internet. And it's amazing. It used to be if you wanted to learn something, you had to go, like, you had to leave your house. And you had to go to a place called a library. Remember this? Novel. And you had to go over to this thing called a card catalog. I have a friend who majored in this in college, and man, I feel bad for her now. Right? <laughs> All right, but look, like you go to the card, and you pull this thing out, and it'd be like, what was it? Like the Dewey Decimal System? Or am I getting that wrong? I don't remember. Okay, but anyway, like, like all this stuff been a while since I've been in, in school. So, all right, and you would like look up author, you would look up the, like the specific place in the library, and if they didn't have something on the specific thing you were looking for, you were out of luck. That, you, well, I guess I'll never learn now. Right? But, but now what happens? I have my phone. I can learn anything about anything ever. With the click. I don't even have to, like, I don't have to leave the bathroom. <laughs> don't act like you don't. <laughs> Welcome to Solid Ground Online. So look. Um, okay. But here's the thing. There are all kinds of free resources on the internet right now that you can use to better engage God's word and understand it more. There are things called commentaries. What commentaries are is basically Bible scholars sit down and they do all the research that they can about one specific book of the Bible. So you can get a commentary on like the Gospel of Mark. And you'll find somebody like, I don't know, an older one would be like William Barclay. All Barclay's commentaries are online for free. I'll give you that site in a minute. But, okay, like he's done the research. Okay, here's all the stuff that we need to know when we're reading Mark. And, and maybe like we, we encounter this teaching of Jesus. Like, I don't know what that means. A well, commentary will help you with that. Look, here's what it means. There are other things called like, like there, there are Bible dictionaries. And okay, like, I mean, what's a cubit? Well, I, I, I Google that. And here's what a cubit is for a, a, a unit of measurement in a Bible dictionary. And, and there are all these just free things online. I'm going to give you three sites that I think are really helpful. And all of them are free. Here's the first one, Bible Project. 
They're the ones who made that fun cartoon earlier. They're an animation studio. I love the Bible Project. The Bible Project, basically, what their goal is to make 21st century Americans and, and, and Western, Westerners understand the Bible. And, and you can find them all on their website, BibleProject.com. Absolutely free. They have a podcast that I think is seminary-level teaching. It's really, really good. But I like their website because of the cartoons. Like, like, man, like, I'll even tell you, like, even this past week, I was watching their thing on Ecclesiastes. It changed how I read the book. I mean, like, if you're going to, okay, like, what's the genre of this book? Check out the Bible Project. They're really good at helping you know how to read stuff. And, I mean, it, it's spot on. Next thing, I'll give you another site, Study Light. This is studylight.org, okay? And what you're going to find on Study Light, you ready for this? Free commentaries and free Bible studies and free Bible dictionaries and all the stuff that you would want to use in your personal engaging of the Word of God. I mean, it's right there. And it's the click of a button. I love, if you're, some of you are like, sometimes I, I preach something, and you're like, man, how did you know that much about first century Greek uh, culture in, 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 uh, in Jerusalem? Well, it's not because I memorized it. So I read a commentary. Now you too, grasshopper, can do what I do. <laughs> that joke hit a lot better than I thought it would. All right. <laughs> Last one, this is really good. U version. U version. It's the Bible app. Okay, you, you can go on Bible.com if, if you don't have a smartphone. Uh, and if you don't, we're praying for you. Um, or, or just Bible.com. Yeah. Or, and, and the great thing about U version, I love they've got Bible studies about anything you would want to study about. It's all 100% free. In fact, if you're on our online campus right now, the Bible like, tab that we have right now, it's powered by U version. Any translation that you would want, I mean, it's just right there. I, like, I think they just, they just updated now. They do stories. Have you seen this now? What they've got is it's, it's like uh, they have like a little quick verse and a devotion and like a person talking about that verse. Like that's every day now they're, they're having that going. It's, just, it's awesome. So you version. So that's another uh, thing I would recommend that you use to sort of engage the Bible. But here's the thing I want you to know, okay? Some of you right now, like you're going, that's awesome. But what I really want to do is I want to read the entire Bible. I don't want to do just a book at a time. So what's my, my best way of doing that? And here's what I would say. If it's your first time encountering the scriptures and you are just absolutely set on reading the entire Bible for yourself, here's how I recommend doing that, okay? Start, not at Genesis. Start at the Gospel of Matthew, all right? Then read through the entire New Testament. So go forward from there. So you go Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, just like through the rest of the New Testament. And then when you're done with that, go back to the Old. And the reason I say to do that is really, really simple, okay? Because, and, and, and if you're just kind of curious, because you want to sort of set up your filters for those. If, if the reason, like you, I say start with the New Testament is because in the New Testament, the character and nature of God is revealed unapologetically in Christ. There's no guessing in him, right? Like Jesus says in John, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So if we wonder what God is like, we look at Jesus. And so Jesus just gives us a very, very concrete face to who God is. He gives us a very concrete, like, understanding of God's intention for humanity. We sinned, we fell. Jesus has restored us to the Father. And so I, the reason I say, listen, start with the New Testament is so that you can set up a framework to understand God in the Old. In fact, as you're reading through the Old Testament, if you started with the New, you're going to spot all these places that you go, oh my gosh, this was prophesying about Jesus. Well, this was, man, this is like a symbol. It was ultimately talking about Christ, like, okay, well, isn't it weird that as I'm reading about Abraham and Isaac, it's talking about Abraham giving his one and only son. I've heard that wording before. It's talking about Abraham carrying wood on, on, like, on him to go up to the place where he would sacrifice his son. Like, like what is that? It's a prophecy of Christ. I mean, you're going to find like, all these places that in the Old Testament, you're like, oh, wow, that was Jesus. I didn't even realize it. Because here's the truth. And if you're taking notes, write this down. Here's why you should engage the scriptures. Because the Bible is about Jesus. It is, like the whole thing. Like, okay, like even in the Old Testament law, yeah. It points to stuff that we could never keep, but he did. I mean, you would just be amazed how much the Bible is about Jesus. And if you think I'm grasping at this, by the way, Jesus even says this plainly. In Luke 24, verse 27, he says this. And like, okay, he, he rises from the dead. He's meeting with some followers. He says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I mean, all Jesus did was he went back, he went, this was about me, this was about me, this was about me, this was about me. Why? Because the Bible is about Jesus. It's also why, listen, you're not going to grow in your relationship with Jesus if you're not encountering him through the word, because he speaks through it constantly. And you might go, okay, well, what do I do with that? 
you ask God to speak. And today, as we wrap up, what I want to do, I just want to pray for you and release you into the Word as a people. One of the things that, that has become just absolutely convicting to me as, as we have just gone through this season of isolation where we're on our own is how much we need to be a people who own our relationship with God. And it's not to the exclusion of being a, a family together, but God forbid we ever get hit with another pandemic like this one, and it's just so severe that we can't be together in person. How will you grow in your relationship with God? Let's say the internet stopped being a thing. What would you do? You'd have to own it. You'd have to go on your own. And the way that that starts is you encountering the scriptures for yourself. And so I want to pray this over you as best I can. So, Father, I, I seek you for my brothers and sisters in this moment. Lord, I pray you release them into your word now. Holy Spirit, I pray you bring illumination and understanding to them. Oh, God, I pray for the one right now who they're going to encounter stuff this week as they're reading the Bible. <laughs> and they're not going to understand a lick of it. But you're going to so stir their heart. They're just going to fall more in love with you. They're like, God, you're speaking through. I don't quite get it yet, but you're doing it. I pray that you make them steadfast. They would continue to follow you in that moment. Lord, I pray you give them a sensitivity to your voice so that they would follow you and they would, they, would, they would listen to you in your word. Lord, I pray for misunderstandings. Once you, gosh, you just can't be saying that. If it is really saying that, Lord, would you convict their hearts and mold them to change? If it's not, would you give them patience and endurance to hold on? Lord, we ask you, let us know you through the scriptures. Brothers and sisters, right now in Jesus' name, I release you into God's word. May you know him better for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.